The Logos of Theos, knowledge in Christian theology. Now, if we're speaking about knowledge um, in the modern world, we do so usually in terms of a subject-object relationship. And so here we have an object, a chair, here we have a subject, David Dean. And knowledge is understood as the process by which I, the subject, come to know this object. Okay? And knowledge is that which is arrived at when I say it is X height, it is X color, and it gets the status knowledge when lots of other people like you agree. And so we all agree that there is a thing called feet or centimeters or inches, and this is X amount of feet or centimeters or inches. We all agree that there is a color yellow. Well, what color is this? What, beige? We all agree there's a thing called the color beige, and we will call this, and we will call this beige. Right? And so I have knowledge, proper knowledge of the chair when it has these, these categorical elements. Now if I don't have knowledge which is shared, then it is not objective knowledge, it is subjective knowledge. Okay? These are the basic ways in which we think about knowledge in the modern world. We usually think about it in terms of a spatial distance between the object and the subject. And the subject looks out across a spatial distance to the object. Okay? And so, if we're studying economics, or physics, or biology, or history, um, in a university, we will imagine um, an object, which is the, the data, and a subject who, across a spatial distance, wearing a white coat with a magnifying glass, will study this thing. Okay? Now, for the vast majority of theological history, this was not how knowledge was understood. And so theology, for most of the last 2,000 years, was understood as a completely different kind of thing than this. Its logos, the logos of theos, was not understood in anything like this fashion, in terms of a spatial distance in terms of categories like objective or subjective. There's a famous quote from a guy called Alistair McIntyre who said that facts like telescopes and wigs for gentlemen were a 17th century invention. Facts didn't exist for the vast majority of theological history. The idea that one would have objective public data about God, for example. Crazy. How was knowledge understood? Well, I'm looking at a couple of people here, such as Gregory of Nyssa and Augustine. And in Gregory's famous text against Eunomius, a whole selection of texts which are cobbled together as his anti-Eunomian writings, he talks about knowledge as a relationship. Knowledge is a relationship between two things. And so my knowledge of this chair is something that happens when I feel it on my buttocks and I have this sense of solidity and I know that this chair will support me and I have a relational knowledge of this thing it's not based upon spatial distance it's based upon intimate interrelationship the feeling that I had of stability or, or, or safety or comfort can't really be expressed perfectly in words it's something that I felt in myself when I was sitting on it. Knowledge is a relationship between the knower and the known. And so he talks about Jesus Christ as the Logos. That is, Jesus Christ is the relationship between God and us. Jesus Christ is a particular kind of relationship between God and God's self and between God and us. So this is a relational understanding of knowledge. It's also more biblical. Remember, Adam knew Eve and she bore him a child. So think of this kind of knowledge. How many universities teach that kind of knowledge? How many universities intentionally teach that kind of knowledge? I think probably, probably very few. That knowledge is a relationship usually an erotic, desiring relationship where one 
where one seeks to relate to the other. And in this relationship, one comes to know. And this knowledge is productive. It changes. Now, in contemporary physics, we are kind of getting to these kind of understandings of knowledge again, because we know that this is, it seems solid, but it actually isn't. There's a radical multiplicity of particles which are moving really, really quickly. And actually, they're creating the illusion of something solid when there's a plurality of atomic activity here. A plurality of atomic activity which affects me and which I affect. And so here, knowledge again is this relationship between two different groups of particles coming to, coming to be in relationship one with another. What's interesting is that Christian theology was understood as a relationship with God. A relationship which was itself knowledge and which produced knowledge that could perhaps be expressed. Okay? And so that's the key point. It's relation. What is it for? Well, the core understanding that we find in the patristic church in Gregory and Augustine is that it's transformative. That knowledge of God is for relationship with God and that this relationship is transformative. It changes us. Why is this a good thing? And here we touch a little bit on our original sin course. It's a good thing because without this relationship human history will look very much like human history. That is, it will look like a legacy of wars, and injustice, and hatred, and violence. But relationship with this God, who is not violence and war and hatred, transforms the self through this relationship into a more peaceful, loving thing. Do we see this? It's the basic idea. And so, instead of a, a spatial distance, where we have subject and object, this coming to know this across a spatial distance, we have a relationship. And the relationship is transformative. It changes this. It changes the subject. If we think about some of the patristic axioms, that the, the creed that in various forms gets said and whether it's the Nicene Creed in its original form, or the Song of Faith in the other Church of Canada, it follows the same basic pattern. And this basic creed was expressed or summed up by Athanasius when he said, God became human, he said man, God became human so that humans could become God. Okay, so we have this movement of God to humanity, which incorporates humanity into God's life. And this incorporation is transformative because God and humanity are not hard and sealed off like my knuckles and this lectern, but they flow into one another and change one another. And so a violent, afraid, anxious, money-grabbing, grasping thing like me can be transformed through relationship with God into something which is more like Christ and less like me. And this transformation is understood in terms of salvation. And this transformation of all these persons transforms a place, a society. Do we see that? And so the social ills that we associate with David Dean being David Dean get overcome by David Dean's knowledge of the Trinity, which transforms David Dean into a, into a different kind of thing, and a society made up of David Dean's becomes a different kind of place. What's theology for? What's knowledge of God for? That. Okay? And so that these, this is not what theology is. This is simply one understanding of what theology is. Okay? But it just is the one understanding, or the kind of one understanding, that, if you like, is the rationale behind the Wabash Grant. And one of the core ideas here is that theology can't remain silent. 
One of the things I like most about the great mystic writers is that they were prolific writers. The great mystics wrote a lot of books. <laughs> you know, John of the Cross, Julian of Norwich, Teresa of Avila, Meister Eckhart. They wrote like, like the bedamned. <laughs> they, they didn't simply soak up all that good God stuff. <laughs> they wanted to share it to do something with it. They wanted to help others be transformed as they were transformed. Jesus Christ comes and doesn't say, okay, God loves you. You love God. Now just love it. He says, okay, you people have a job to do. He, when he sends out the 12 and later on when the 70 gets sent out, they're told two things. They're told to proclaim the good news and heal the sick. And throughout the Gospels, healing the sick in, is usually understood parabolically. Becoming a different kind of thing. And so those who know Jesus Christ, um, those who come to be called the church, have a job to do. Theology, this knowledge of God, is a relationship which is transformative, a.k.a. salvific, and it also can't be kept to oneself. Hopefully it spreads through society, it transforms people and places. And so... What would a relationship between theology and the arts look like with this prevailing rationality? Okay? Is there a way that the arts could be used, and again, apologies for the utilitarian language here, but is there a way in which the arts could be used by theology to facilitate its goals? Can we come to relationship with God through other forms other than simply scientific discourse such as has dominated in theology for quite some time? Can we proclaim or can we express something of what it means to be in relationship with God artistically? Now think about the church for most of the last 2,000 years. If writing scientific theology was the only way to get it done, and you've got literacy rates of far below 8, 7%, 8%, you've got trouble. So there has to be other ways of doing it. And these ways we call the, the glam rock opera, which is liturgy, <laughs> these ways involve stained glass windows, these ways involve music. And these are things which teach and shape and express and inspire. And theology, at least in the universities, for hundreds of years has said, we can't do that. And it wasn't entirely stupid that they said they can't do that. Because if you're in a university, like universities that I've worked in in the past, you'll be kicked out if you say, the student's exam will be a painting. That's one way to get fired from a university like Trinity College. So I will test the students by getting them to to whistle something. Or dance something. That's the end of your career right there. And so theology has, for the last few hundred years, has been trying to prove itself as worth a place in the university. We've been trying to say, we're just like you. You study objectively, and you study data, and you stand back from the objects, and you inquire into them with your white coats, and you're magnifying. And we're just, we do that thing too. We're just like you. We deserve a place in these universities. When I was a student... It was, and I'm a little bit neurotic about this, but so many of my professors would hunt after philosophers who said something remotely similar to theology and just be tremendously excited when they found them. Because these philosophers are legitimate. They're they're proper scholars in in universities, and we've got to be like that. There was a sort of a a pathos about this. It It was somehow pathetic. But it speaks to the way that theology as an academic discourse, has shunned a 